always done. Um, I'm joined by um, Barry Anderson, which most of you know. Barry is our managing director um, at our sister properties um, in the UK. Um, managing director Barry, I guess that's it's an overall title, but you're the you're the vine guy. You look after the vineyards, the whole wine operation. I'm the vine, the wine guy. And those that don't know me, I'm sure you would have you would have met me along the along the line. Anything wine, get hold of me. Um, I head up the vineyards. Uh, we've got 46 acres planted on Manning's Heath and a further four acres on Lenersby Gardens. Um, we're busy establishing our UK wine brand, and hopefully. We can just get the jolly planning right we'll be building a winery in the next couple of months which will be really exciting uh the idea being that we will launch our first uk sparklings by 2023 so very long term and it's great to have you all along for the journey and in the interim we obviously continue representing Vinguela's wines uh, very proud to be part of the establishment great wines to work with and and it's such a great team to to work with as well all right, yeah, always good to have you on these calls, Barry. And then we're also joined by Annie, which most of you know by now as well. Annie's always been kind enough to help us out on the food side of things because, uh, well, big part of, of wine is sharing it with people you, you like, but also food is as big a part of, of the, the enjoyment and, and what wine is about. So. And he's uh, also joining us this week and next week again. And um, any of you can hear me. Um, it's been a bit of a crazy week, so I'm not even sure what you ended up uh, deciding on which wine to select and what wine to pair with this this evening. So maybe, yeah, maybe just fill us in on what you've got in store. Hi everyone. So today we're going. Well, I chose the Catalina de Semillon. And with that, we paired a nice big whole pork belly, which we're going to do on the fire over here. And it will be show off the view a little bit as well. So of course, we're going to have to start have a braai. Um, um, so to start off with, the first thing you're going to have to do is marinate it. So we've got a nice big whole pork belly over here. When you're looking for a pork belly, you're going to have to look for something that's a little bit it has a nice fat to meat ratio. You don't want a lot of, lot of fat on there. Otherwise, it's just going to be a very, very oily piece of meat that you're going to be stuck with. So first things first, uh, you're going to have to score the skin. And then when you're marinating, it's just to get all those flavors and everything kind of penetrate that thick skin and just get to the meat and marinate and actually flavor the meat as well. So we chose a very, very simple marinade, especially all the flavors that's in the Catalina. So we've got a bit of citrus. So we've got some orange zest, some lemon zest, some lemon or lime zest. We've got a bit of thyme, some coriander seeds, some anise seeds, some bay leaves, peppercorns, and then, of course, a nice coarse salt. So you're just going to chuck all of that on your belly, and then you're going to have to marinate it for about 24 to 48 hours. But while you're, when you're marinating it, you're going to have to leave it skin side up. I just flipped this one around to show you all the nice little ingredients, which you can see a little bit better on the meat side, on the skin side. And then when you're done marinating it, because it's all this coarse flavors and stuff like that, you don't want to get rid of all those flavors. It's just all the coarse salt. You don't want all that big chunks of salt on your meat. So you're just going to crap, just wipe all that stuff down. Don't wash it, otherwise you're going to wash all those flavors away. So you're just going to wipe all that flavor. Extra salt away. I'll just move these quickly. A little bit of chopped cabbage for our sides a little bit later. And then we're just going to chuck this on the braai. Need a bit of a medium to low heat or coals. You don't want it too high, otherwise you're just going to burn all that fat out. So I'm just going to get that ready. Can pop this on quickly. And then again, you want to keep all those flavors and everything on there. So we're going to put it skin side down. Oh, skin side up. Sorry. Close it, and then that's going to go for about four hours very, very slowly. So you're just going to hang it on a hook. So you don't want direct heat on it. You just want it to go very, very, very slowly and stand and just monitor your heat, monitor your belly, keep an eye on it. And yeah, and then wait, have a glass of wine. And or two. <laughs> <laughs> or two. I was saying it's four hours. I think you're going to go a little bit more than two. So yeah. 
I must say, Annie, that is the best braai that you've ever done. What I like about it is that you've got your hands free to pour yourself some wine and enjoy wine while it's just the job is going on by itself. <laughs> Annie, do you literally leave that there for four hours and just keep topping up the coals? Yes. So you just leave it hanging there and just monitoring it. And then you're just flipping it over and you see this getting a little bit more heat on this side. Then you just flip it over and you do the skin side. But you don't want, like I said, you don't want a lot of heat on it. So we're going to crispen the skin up a little bit later. So when you guys come back, then I'll show you how to crispen the skin up and get it all ready and have a bunch of sides and everything ready with it as well. Yes, I'm really jealous that I'm not with you guys right now. I tell you, that's going to be a feast. Did I hear that right? Is it four hours? <laughs> We've got a long tasting ahead, I gather, Johan. Yeah, so it's more than a one bottle of wine barbecue. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, Annie uh, is going. Um, let's, let's look at the, the wine. So... Um, we've selected six wines to go into one box, so it's a, it's a mixed box um, that Barry and them have made available on, on our online shop. So um, you, you don't have to open all three of, of the wines um, back home, but um, I've got all three of them open just to, to talk you through and to taste um, through the wines and just give you a little bit of of info on them so when you have the guests over then hopefully you can can share some of the the story and information um, on these wines so um, first up we've got a, a sparkling wine um, and we don't want to rush through it but i'm just going to keep it a little bit shorter than usual tonight because we have to do um, three wines um, but there is some first time people joining us so maybe just to help you with where Benguela Cove is at and who we are um, obviously um, South African winery um, with a connection back in in England with a sister property a second winery um, on that side as well um, I'm just repeating some of the stuff I said because I only just now switched on uh, the Facebook viewers as well so just forgive me for repeating some stuff facebook changed some of the settings so it was a, a bit of a, a struggle but welcome everyone on, on facebook as well um, you can ask questions for those joining on zoom there's a q a button which you can post your questions and we'll pick up on them and address them as we go along for those watching on on facebook um, you can also just in the comment field if you've got any questions throw them in there and they'll get sent through to me on, on this side. So we'll please ask anything you'd like to know, um, more than welcome to. So African continent, South Africa, obviously all the way at the bottom, where we based is right at the tip of the continent, uh, at the bottom end of South Africa, which is called the, the Western Cape. So when you arrive down here, you'll fly into Cape Town and we're about just more than an hour's drive into this yellow pocket over here, which is a, a appellation called the Walker Bay region. The blue that you see is obviously uh, the ocean. So as I said, Cape Town, the mother city will welcome you. Very quiet at the moment with what's going on lately with all the restrictions. Um, we've had news now that the borders are open for international travel again. So we we're hoping to see you all this side of the world um, soon. So, uh, yeah, but up until now, Barry, it's been, I've been walking in the waterfront last week and it's just, you can't believe it's how quiet it is. Um, this small, it's a small town there. around the world, I tell you. Well, I hope I can get a little trip across in January without <laughs> having, a, having to be locked down for two weeks when I arrived. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, Hours drive out of Cape Town, you call, you come to a little town called Hermanus. Um, most of you that have been to South Africa or you're planning to come to South Africa, this is kind of a given that will be on your list to visit. It's a beautiful little town and it's a, it's a, it's a very a popular tourist uh, destination um, for, for various reasons. I mean, some of the most amazing beaches. I don't know. I know you don't want to be seeing um, photos now of beaches and sunshine and stuff, but um, this is this is where we're at. So just bear with me 
obviously. Uh, it's, lovely. it's lovely to see it. <laughs> um, it's a home to all these uh, Southern Light whales. The town is quite uh, well known for, for the whales that come out here to play during this time of the year. Um, and obviously quite an impressive or a popular food scene and most important, the wine scene. So it's uh, being so close to, to the ocean and to the being in the Walker Bay, um, it's what is known as a, as a cool climate, grape growing region. Um, so it produces some of the, the finest wines coming out of South Africa is in this little uh, pocket uh, where we're at. So um, it's quite a, a well-known um, wine region for, for quality wines um, specifically, but made in a, in a cool climate style, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later on. But cooler climate wines just have a, a level of of elegance and finesse and, and brightness and purity to them that people uh, really enjoy and uh, that most of you are familiar with our wines, but those that aren't and have had bought the mixed box, uh, I think it's a, you'll, you'll quickly pick up on what I mean by the, the elegance and just the, the drinkability um, of, of the wines. The image you see here is Benguela Cove. So it's this is, we're just outside of the town about a five or a 10 minutes uh, drive. Um, so this is what you see here, if you can follow me, is, uh, is Benguela Cove Estate, the property. So it's 220 acres, uh, a hectare, so that's about, Barry help me, 450, 500 acres, yep. more or less, of which um, 70 hectares or 100, or what's that, it's close to 200 acres planted with, um, with a vineyard. So you'll see all these little sections and pockets you see are all different vineyard um, blocks. So um, this is fairly a, a fairly young vineyard. It's uh, been planted 18 years ago. Um, being so close to the to the ocean, you know, it's quite marginal as to where you can have a, a vineyard. So no one ever dared having a vineyard this close to the ocean. There's much more, call it suitable spots to have a vineyard which is more ideal um, better soils better growing conditions to have a vineyard over the years the the mind shift and the focus have changed to uh, to seeking out the really quality um, areas as well and that is where benguela cove then came from they didn't really have any experience of what will work on on this spot so they took a bit of a shotgun approach and planted a whole lot of different grape varietals We've kind of a little bit of a, a freak of nature for a lack of a better descriptor in that we've got five different soil types on quite a small um, farm. So that's why we've got all these little vineyards that you see. So not having any history of what was going to work, they planted, let's say Cabernet Sauvignon on all the different soil types on the property. And what you can't see from this photo is that it's quite, um, it's quite steep slopes to the side of the property as well. So they also planted the various grape varietals on the southern slopes, northern slopes, eastern and western slopes. And how the vine works is that it, depending on the slope or the soil type it's planted on, it, even though all of it might be Cabernet, planted with Cabernet Sauvignon, those wines look completely different in the glass in how they, they taste and smell and, and behave just because of the influence of, of the soil and the slope they planted on, which makes for different um, microclimates. But all in all, Benguela Cove as an, as an entire property is uh, hugely influenced by its proximity to the ocean. Um, so it's unmistakably cool climate, thanks to the big blue aircon that we've got next to us. Um, but being so close also makes for a, quite a, a unique and a distinct wine style. So um, having wines that have got a completely different character and style than anything else that you'll see coming out of South Africa. For us, it's, you, it, it's important to preserve this, this style and, and characteristics that we have in our wine. So we only use grapes coming from our property because it's very common for any wineries across the world to buy in grapes from different regions to get complexity into the wine or to get something into their cellar that they might be lacking. We don't do any of that. Whatever you see in a glass of Benguela Cove wine will only come from this piece of land because what we 
trying to do is to, to produce wines that you can see and sense and taste this unique uh, vineyard at the southern tip of Africa. So we're what they call an estate winery. We certify it as an estate winery. It's not just something we can claim. Um, but to be an estate winery, you're only allowed to use your own fruit. And it's kind of a, a dying breed these days. There's not a lot of estate wineries around anymore because it's become so easy to ship and truck grapes all over the place. But as I mentioned, we're about showcasing our site and our property in the glass. So um, that's we'll only uh, use grapes coming from this property. Just some more images. Um, it's the cellar we finished in time for the 2017 um, vintage. So even though the vineyards have been around for a couple of, of years, um, it's only as recent as 2017 that we've um, started making wines uh, on site. So um, Benguela Curve, the property is, is owned by a lady called Penny Streeter and her husband, Nick. Um, so it's a family owned winery. Family is very involved in everything that happens on the estate. Um, uh, it was once Penny took ownership of the property in 2013, things really went into second gear. Um, the winery came along, we designed the winery uh, it's a 400 ton winery. So just to help you, it's about 400, 500,000 bottles is what our capacity is that we can do from, from the estate. Uh, Penny then also went out and did a whole new complex with restaurants, um, tourist facility, <clears throat> wine tasting facility, conferencing. Um, so Armanus being such a popular tourist destination uh, we get a, a lot of visitors to the winery and there's quite a lot of stuff on, on offer for those that are, are making their plans to travel down south, like very soon. This is Annie's uh, restaurant, obviously perfect for weddings, giving our views, some art galleries that we've got here. So yeah, please come and, and visit us um, when you're around some wine tasting on the lagoon as well. So uh, yeah, but let's get into the, into the wines. Uh, the first wine is is a is a MCC or Method Cup Classic. You can see the the spelling over there. So um, what Method Cup Classic means is is just um, a certification for sparkling wine that's made in the Champagne method of making sparkling wine. So there's obviously various ways and techniques of making sparkling wines. Um, we're not going to go into detail on, on all of them, but if you want to call your product a Method Cup Classic, it is, has to be made in the exact same process of, as what they use in Champagne. We're obviously not allowed to call our wines Champagne, but as far as the grape varietals that we use to make it and the technique, it is um, exactly the same as what they, what they do in, in Champagne in France. Um, Barry, do you have some bubbles there? I do. I've, just, I've got my bottle ready to open. I'm not going to surprise this time. I'll leave you to open it the right way. So just to let's open it. Just if you want to tell your friends back home a little party trick, whenever a sign of a quality bottle of sparkling wine is, if you give, give this wire six twists, it should open and be able to come off. It's obviously not true, but it's uh, you can entertain them with that. Um, when opening, I know it's it's the most amazing sound in the world is to hear a cork from a sparkling wine bottle just pop out because it just announces everything that's good, celebrations and having a good time. But for the sake of the product, it's not good um, shooting out uh, the cork one you're at the risk of, of losing some of what's inside but also for for the bubbles it's not ideal to shoot it out and lose a lot of co2 gas because by just giving it a gentle opening you you preserve some of those bubbles so always just keep your thumb on on top keep it firmly just as it starts coming out you apply pressure back onto it so it doesn't shoot out you can keep the top hand still and just keep the the bottom of the bottle just a, a twist and you'll feel the cork coming out and you, what the French call it a whisper. It's just the slightest 
pop. That is what you got. That wasn't quite a whisper, but I <laughs> okay. So, sparkling wine. Um, what I always recommend is just to pour a little bit and to give the glass a, just to give the glass a little bit of a rinse. If you don't, you can just throw it out or have a sip. But the reason for doing that is is the the bubbles in the wine. The worst enemy for those bubbles are any like particles from a tablecloth that you might have used to dry the glass and even worse than that some residue from a dishwashing uh, liquid because those just make the the bubbles disappear instantly so if you ever have a bottle and you the bubbles aren't lasting and you're wondering what's going on the chances are really good that it's some of those cloth particles or the dishwashing uh, liquid that um, made it the bubbles disappear I'm not going to stick on this. Um, this is this method of making sparkling wine is called various things a, across the world. Um, it'll, as I mentioned, Cup Classic is what we call it in South Africa. You will be familiar with Cava. The Italians call it Method Classico. So Prosecco is not following the same method. Prosecco is a, is a different uh, way of doing it. It's a more commercial, high volume, not as premium uh, way of, of doing it so uh, but the Italians do do the the method champagnes the champagne method as well um, so <clears throat> just short just to keep it brief this um, what is different about this process is that the most common found one would be like taking still wine and in injecting gas into it like you would do with a soda stream machine what is different in the case of these wines is that the CO2 gas, the bubbles in, in the actual wine comes from a second fermentation. So we take normal still wine, like table wine, we'll add sugar to that and we'll add the yeast cells to that. So now the yeast cells are feeding off the sugar and one of the byproducts that they produce while they're converting the sugars is uh, CO2 gas. But these bottles we close with, you can see there at the bottom with a, with a beer cap. So the gas can't escape the bottle. So it becomes part of, of the wine inside. So the CO2 gas, the bubbles are all a, a natural process, a byproduct of the, the yeast cells, the secondary fermentation. Those yeast cells, when all the sugars are converted, they don't have anything to feed off anymore. So they eventually die and settle to the bottom of, of the bottle. Um, this for us is very important, keeping the wine in contact with the dead yeast cells, because this is where the magic happens over time and years in the bottle, those yeast cells disintegrate and they give these beautiful flavors and aromatics back into the wine, because these wines are usually quite neutral after their second fermentation, but with, with time on this, we call it lees, uh, it gives a lot of aroma and flavor back into the wine. Depending on your wine style, you can keep it 12 months, you can keep it five years or 10 years. Um, this specific one, we've kept three years um, on the lease. So what we're after is a nice, like a nougat, toasty, ever so slight nuttiness into the wine. And you usually get those aromas after about three, four years in the wine. Obviously, we can't serve it to you with the yeast in it. So we do remove it by a process called riddling, which we collect all the yeast cells by turning the bottle over time, like you can see on this image. So all the dead yeast sits in the cap of the bottle. Um, you'll notice that it's still got the beer cap on. That frozen section at, in the bottom, uh, the, the section in the bottom, we, we freeze. Um, like you can see on the second image, you can turn it upside down and still sits at the top. So it's a little bit of frozen yeast cells and a little bit of frozen wine. Once you remove that beer cap, because by now you've got six bars of pressure um, inside the bottle, which is about three times you know, the, the pressure of a car's tires. So that six bars of pressure just shoots out um, that frozen section. Then you can just top it up with a little bit of wine for what you've lost, put the cork on and put the little wire on to keep the cork back in because you've now still got about five and a half bar of pressure inside the bottle. So the cork on its own won't stay inside without the little, what we call the, the wire hood. Um, 
and then they go into the ice bucket and you've, you've got your, your bubbly. As I said, never a good idea to shoot out the cork, as I have mentioned, but also remember that this cork leaves the bottle at 110 kilometers per hour. So not advisable to point it at someone or to have it shooting into the, into the roof. So last, while we're busy with stats, last piece of useless information is um, one bottle of sparkling wine has got 49 million bubbles inside of it. 49 million bubbles. I didn't count it myself. They worked it out in, in a lab somewhere, but again, just some info that you can, can share. Uh, this specific one, uh, we do two bottle fermented uh, cup plus six. This one that we're tasting is the Jour de Vie, the one on the right hand side. So we've been a little bit cheeky and giving it um, a French name, which means the joy of living or happiness, or cheerfulness, um, which come to this time of the year, um, we start celebrating, even though it was a bit of a miserable year. Um, let's just end it in style, I guess, with a, a bottle of these bubbles. I'm talking a lot, Barry. Do you have any comments on the wine or any? Well, you know, it's one of my favorites and certainly one of our best sellers in the UK, that in the cuvee. I um, also see there you we were top 10 this year, am I right, with, with that sparkling or with the MCC? Yeah, so this, the one we're tasting tonight was in the, in the top 10 um, best South African um, bottle fermented sparkling wine. So um, it is our, our flagship sparkling. As I said, it, we keep it for up to three years in the cellar before we release it. So it is, um, we're shooting for the stars with this one in terms of quality. And it was, yeah, we're happy that it got acknowledged as one of the top 10 finest. Yeah, and then just aging potential. I know we're still on the 2000, last couple of cases of 2014. I mean, it's tasting delicious. So it's just improved with age. What would you see, what would you say is the best sort of time to drink these wines, um, you know, yeah, that's a that's a good question. You know, we sparkling wine isn't like um, like red wines or some white wines where you cellar them. Once they're under cork, uh, once we've removed the beer cap and we put the cork in, ideally, in the ideal world, you want to drink them within the first twelve months since they've been what we call degorged, which is the process of removing um, the lees. Um, that's why we also at the back of these bottles put a de degorging date. So we sell them as long as possible at the winery and then just remove that dead we sell as the as we sell them off or as the orders come in. So they would really limit that time on the cork. You know. So older bubblies um, ideally are kept in, in the wineries on the lease because that preserves them rather than cellaring them on the corks. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for asking that. And then just to, just to clarify for all our viewers that the 2014 is the vintage. That's the year that we pick the grapes, not the year that it's, that it's released. Yeah, so that the 2014, um, some of the last ones we've sent out was on the on that dead he sells for four and a half years now so it's quite a quite a lengthy process it takes the aging and the whole process of sparkling wines is even longer than um, than the production of red wines yeah and then just lastly the varieties you used in that in making that um, sparkling yeah so it's roughly speaking about uh, two thirds um, Chardonnay and one third of uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, is, that your, is that your preference? Is that due to the vineyards you've got? You know, I know we've got Pinot and Chardonnay planted here with similar sort of percentages. Um, is that the is that the ideal blend to use? Um, this, I guess there's not an ideal blend, but for the, for the style and what we had in mind, you know, Chardonnay gives a bit more longevity. It gives more of that, uh, nutty, apple-y notes. So we want, um, uh, knowing that we, we're working on a three-year program that Chardonnay comes into its peak. So it's important to have that as the majority grape varietal, but then the Pinot does add a little bit of red apple and cherry and it gives a, a roundness where the, the Chardonnay, can, not lean, the Chardonnay is just very elegant and fine. The, the Pinot gives it a, a bit of, of volume, um, if you like, even though Pinot doesn't 
age as good as Chardonnay, it does have a role to play. So that's why in our case, it's only a third of, of the blend, while Chardonnay is the, the predominant one of the two. Okay. All right. Let's move on to that exciting second wine in your lineup. The second one. So yeah, this one, as I already mentioned, quite um, biscuity, brioche, a little bit of of lime, you get some of, as I said, that red apple that's coming from the from the Pinot. But the major difference between these wines and if you compare that to um, the method they would use predominantly for uh, Prosecco's and even the cheapest sparkling wines is this, the size of, of the bubble you'll taste. This is a very, very fine and light bubble where some of those others are more like soda, like Coca-Cola, they're more gassy and, and aggressive. That's the major difference other than the beautiful aromas that you get on them. For sparkling, it's also important to, for us that are doing wine tasting, is not to swirl it, again, for the sake of the bubbles. You, there's enough gas coming up, off that elevates the flavors out of the glass. You can just keep it still and smell and taste it. You don't have to do like we do for, for whites and reds, give it a swirl. Let's move on to the next wine. Uh, The next wine is our, which I'm very happy you included into the box. And I'm happy that we're doing this tasting so that I can get an opportunity to taste it as well. It's our flagship white wine. It's called uh, Catalina and it's named after these planes that you see on, on the screen. They were called Catalinas. Um, and from previous images you would have seen, we've got this big lagoon running out into the ocean in front of Benguela Cove, the property. And during the, the Second World War, these planes uh, were based um, here on Benguela Cove and the, the lagoon was used as, a, as, a, as their landing strip. And we had 16 pilots uh, here during the Second World War. They all came from America, flew over Africa, dropped off a whole lot of cargo but because they could stay up in the air for up to 22 hours they were used to patrol the coastline um, of southern africa being the supply route to the east a lot of uh, the german submarines were based here to shoot down all the supply ships and so these guys were called in to take care of the submarines um, in return again so just a little bit of of story and history that um, that so we named it after these planes um, Catalina, as I mentioned, is our, is our flagship white. It's a single vineyard, so uh, meaning it comes from one specific um, vineyard on the farm, and it's right here on the southern slopes. So in the southern hemisphere, southern slopes is slightly cooler than the northern slope, just because of how the sun passes. It's the reverse, obviously, your part of the world. But so this is a vineyard planted on cooler slopes in a cool climate with the added cooling effect from this big blue um, sea, the Atlantic Ocean, which like clockwork in the afternoon starts blowing a breeze over our vines. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a extreme vineyard site in that it's got the, all these cooling effects on it and you see it on this wine, it's very focused, very uh, precise, tightly knit wine, a big acidity, um, lots of structure and, and, and backbone to the wine. And the semillon of all white wines are the ones that, that age the best. But then Benguela Cove is also known for the, the wines to have uh, amazing longevity, you know, ability to, to age in bottles. So we thought, let's combine the two, you know, the fact that the wines age so well, but also the fact that Semillon really lends itself to aging. So we've kind of, we've made a wine here that the intent of it is, even though it's a lot of fun and it's beautiful drinking it now, the idea of these wines is to, to have it and to keep it for five years, seven years, 10 years and beyond, and to track how they change and evolve with time in bottle. So it's a very special um, vineyard. It only produces 1,400 bottles. Uh, that's all we can make, unfortunately, um, of this. It's all hand-picked. Semillon, as you can see, has got quite a big 
berry, so you have to work very gently with a big berry and a soft skin. So you have to be very careful in, in dealing with it uh, when picking and bringing it to the cellar. Once in the cellar, we put it in these horizontal tanks with a bladder inside. It just gently pushes out the, the juice from within the berries. Um, it's quite modern a machine that we use. It's uh, the one we use keeps all the oxygen out of it. Oxygen being the biggest enemy of, of white wines. So you see when we press it out, the juice coming out is perfectly uh, clean, uh, not clean, but green and preserved from any form of oxygen. If there was oxygen exposure, it would have gone brown. It's a bit like leaving a cut apple outside. You know, within a few minutes, it starts turning brown. The same with, with grape juice. Once in the cellar, once it's pressed out, it goes into one of these stainless steel tanks. You'll see those little dotted sections of, of cooling jackets, we call them. So we've got cold water running around the tank so we can, preserve, uh, we can control the temperature of the alcoholic fermentation. So we started out nice and cool. And with this cool fermentation temperature, you get all these beautiful fruit flavors, tropical fruit and all these aromatics. Um, so we do half of the fermentation in here at a nice low temperature to get all those flavors going. And then halfway through, we transfer all that, what is fermenting grape juice into barrels. So the second half of the fermentation is then in these French oak barrels, which you can't control the temperature. So it, the temperature goes up and it ends at a much higher fermentation temperature. So you don't get all that nice fruit flavors, but we've already had captured that in the first part of the fermentation with this now slightly warmer ferment, you get all the richness and the texture and the body, the creaminess that you get on your palate happens from this now warmer ferment. So we do a, a bit of both. And obviously the oak barrel just also gives it the ever so slightest little bit of, of toastiness uh, to the wine as well. That is the, the Catalina, um, you know, I've mentioned it many times before, but what we're doing on, on Benguela Cove is to try and capture where we at our soils, our growing conditions in the glass and to just transport that to you. Um, so we don't get that involved in the winery with all sorts of winemaking techniques and fancy stuff. And when it comes to selecting those battles as well, we, we use slightly older barrels, so the impact on the wine is slightly reduced, but we also use those barrels that are, are quite gentle and, and um, they don't overpower the wine, you know, so it's lower toasting levels and stuff. Because what we want to show you is not the barrel or what we can do or the winemaker can do in the cellar, what we want to show off in this wine. And I, I think um, it shows it beautifully is where we're from, you know, the influence of the ocean, the influence of the, the what naturally grows here and um, our climate is all hopefully captured beautifully in this glass. That's the idea of this wine, but then also you know, to show off the ageability and the age worthiness um, of these wines. Hats yeah, so off to you, yeah. and this, is, this is an exceptional wine and, and really something that it's an honor to drink. Um, exciting to see how this is going to develop in the bottle and with age. So, Johan, just tell us a little bit. You've got the three bottles in the pack. Do you let your, I know we, we sell this wine on allocation, um, and you actually let the, the buyers know when the ultimate time is to drink the, the bottles of wine? Yes, yeah. So, it, it comes in a, a, a three pack of three bottles, and for the reason for selling them like that and not as individual bottles is, yes, it's absolutely gorgeous now and it's beautiful to drink. But if you only buy the one bottle, then come five years from now, or 10 years from now, and you don't have a second and a third bottle to check how the wine is evolved with time, then you're missing out big time, you know, and that is, it's fine to open one now, but what we really want to show you is, is what happens with these wines in time. So it's something you hold on to, it's something you treasure and you don't have to open your bottles. I've opened them this side and I'll inform you in eight years from now, 
open your 2018, it's showing beautiful, or in four years from now, open your 2017, or we'll guide you through when to open which um, vintages. So what you get is um, an allocation of, of three bottles. You can obviously take more if you like, and if they, all the bottles are individually numbered, and those numbers belong to you. So if you've got bottle 90, 91, 92, for as long as you take up your allocation, Barry, that'll be your numbers for, for life. So uh, a nice um, collectible, but also a, a great gift to give to someone because it can't be, no one can can buy it. It's like you own it, it's it's yours, you know? So it's something money can't really buy once it's you've taken that allocation. So as I said, the idea is for aging, but you know, it it's, just been picking up accolades left, right, and center. So no problem in, in having it now. You know, it's gone from Platter Five Stars to Tim Atkin, which is a, um, a master of, of wine, happened to be from the UK, gave us 94 out of 100. I don't know about you, but I never got scores like that at school. So I'm happy for, <laughs> for one of our kids to be able to do it. Uh, this wine won the South African champion Semyon at a, at a wine show when it was a little bit younger. It's now recently gone and again um, won uh, at the Terroir Awards, the top Semyon um, from South Africa as well. So it is, it is our, our pride and joy and yeah, I'm super happy to be, to be sharing this with, with you guys. We've just released the uh, 18, Barry. I think you've just got your 18. We, we received that about a month ago. Yes, we've got, we're, we're starting to release that now to our customers. Yes. So I mean, it, it's, we deliberately keep this wine back in the cellar in bottle before we release it. So we're only releasing the 18 now, just so they've got a little bit of, of time and, and a year or two um, on them. But um, yeah, I've talked to Barry. He's got a couple, a lot of people um, that have taken up the allocations, but we've sent Barry a few extras as well, should anyone be, be keen on, on getting their hands on these. Oh, I'm there we go. quite tight with those allocations to us in the UK, so mm -hmm. give me a call if you'd like to reserve your, your case. Oh. We move on. Oh. <laughs> Nice green apple and, and citrus and like quincy notes. And as I said, on the palate, it's just so much precision and, and focus and structure. It's, um, you, know, you can just imagine how this is going to benefit from time. You know, it will get a little bit more oily. It will get even more toasty. It's already got some of that, like it, what reminds me of like struck match characters um, in, the, in the wine. So really complex. Uh, complex uh, white wine. All right, moving along, how are we doing for time? Barry, stop me if there's any questions that I'm missing. Uh, next wine that we've included um, or in the box that we're doing this week is our Estate Shiraz. Um, so it, it sits within the Estate um, range where we do a couple of, of wines. We do a Chardonnay, we do a Battle Fermented Sauvignon Blanc, which is really interesting. We do Pinot Noir, we do a, a red blend, and we do a Malbec, Malbec and a Cabernet Sauvignon. But we've, uh, we've decided to go with the, the Syrah for, for this week. Next week, we'll be looking at, at the blend. Um, so there's a, as a saying that all good wines or all the great wines in the world have a view of the ocean. So I just, there's just proof of a Syrah vineyard overlooking the Atlantic. And um, Syrah is, is quite an interesting grape. It's, you know, it's unlike Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Noir or Chardonnay or Merlot that is very limited to certain areas, soils, climates where it really performs well. Syrah is like a chameleon, you know, it works in like cool climate like ourselves or moderate or even like really warm climates. It works equally well. It just produces wines that are stylistically very, very different, um, which makes it interesting. And I'm not, I'm not saying the cooler 
climate wines are better than the warmer climate ones. The wines are so different that you can hardly um, compare them to each other. And it's a, it's a matter of, of preference, what you, what you like. So typically from around here, um, the Syrahs will be more so a, towards the spicy, savory side, a little bit of, of smoky notes. We're just down the road from us, hours and a half drive to Paul or Stellenbosch or Swartland regions. It's, it's bigger, it's juicier, it's more, got more sweet fruit, chocolatey notes, it's more fruit driven. Um, and those are generally called Shiraz. And the more savory, spicy side of it is called Syrah, like we've got on our label. So that's always something to, to look out for. And it's just like, a, gives you some guidance as to what to expect in terms of style um, inside uh, the bottle. So. Syrah, Shiraz, it's exactly the same thing. It's just a, an, an indication of the, the style in which it was, was made. So everything is hand-picked, hand-sorted. When it comes to the winery, we inspect every single bunch. Once those berries are removed from the stems, we do a berry selection. So we pull out all the stops when it comes to, to quality. Um, every single berry, every bunch gets um, individually inspected, not by fancy machinery. There's nothing that replaces the eye. So it's quite a labor in, intensive process, but we're in the game of, of producing quality wine. So we, we go the, the extra mile when it, when it comes to our wines. Um, this is just a technique of extracting color, you know, the grapes, the juice inside, when we pick it, it's still white in color. With time, when it's in contact with those skins and the fermentation happens, we just mix juice or what we call pump juice over those skins. And a bit like a tea bag, you just extract color and tannin and all the, the goods, the aromas um, out of those skins as the fermentation goes on. And obviously within the skin is all the red pigment. And from there, the juice or the wine eventually starts turning red in color, like you can see on the photo. So again, like the, like the Cup Classic, um, this is a wine that's been doing well for us. I told you that Syrah can be made across all sorts of climates. So just about Every single winery in South Africa produces a Shiraz or a couple of them. So we were quite uh, happy this year to be, we've got a, a Shiraz challenge in South Africa where they get a bunch of uh, Shiraz or Syrah expert judges together that do a blind tasting of all the Shiraz that gets produced. And this one that we've included um, got into the top 12 best um, Syrahs uh, in South Africa. We actually had a bit of a battery. I'm not sure if I even told you. Um, they, they announced a short list of 20 wines before they announced the top 12. And we had a bit of a, a problem in that we've had our Lighthouse Syrah and the Estate Syrah in the top 20. So that we were fighting ourselves for a spot into the into the top 12, but yeah, thank goodness one of them made it all the way. So yeah, really, really proud of this. The estate, sir, was it? Yeah. The estate, yeah. So something you should really get your hands on for the Christmas table. That's just the, the lighthouse, which you can also get from Barry. So worth trying both. They're from different slopes on the property, so slightly different. So when you put the two next to each other, you can clearly see the impact of slope and soil types and microclimates, even though they are 100 yards from each other, uh, a fun exercise to do just to see the impact of, of nature and the subtle differences in soils that they have on these wines. Okay. Well, uh, I've just seen a message from Annie. I believe the weather's turning there. Can you believe it of all things to happen? So I think we should switch back to her. She said there's a couple of drops of rain arriving. All and right. We'll come back to me after that, I think. Annie? Annie? Yes. So, as I did any bit of a TV show, we cheated a little bit and we got a bit that we cooked a little bit earlier this week, this morning. So we got one that's cooked. So now, anything of pork belly, you want to get a bit of a crispy skin on there. So we cooked it more on this... Whew, 
It's got a little bit toasty, sorry for that. But yeah, so we've kicked it a little bit more on the uh, meat side of it. So to get your skin nice and crispy, you need a nice hot fry. And you're just going to flip that and put that on a lot closer to the... That's a bit too close. Just to get your skin nice and crispy. And then pair it with this. Pair it with this, we got some green peppers and some Granny Smith apples that we're just going to do as a bit of a side that we marinate in a bit of honey, a bit of thyme um, and we use a bit of verjuice as well just to get that flavours of the semolon just to pop through so all this green flavours just picks up all that notes in the Cat Catalina which is absolutely fantastic so we're just going to get some nice grill marks on these oh, Uh, so yeah, so you just got a nice crisp up the skin, and then of course with your belly you can do any any side. So we've set the table a little bit. So we got some mashed potatoes. We've got a bit of Brussels sprouts on there as well. And then you saw me early on doing a bit of um, purple cabbage that we just grilled as well on the fire and put a bit of mayo over it and just garnish that up. So that's on there as well. So it's just all these little nice little flavors for Christmas and all these colors. Keep it nice and fresh, keep it nice and simple. So you want those green flavors for the Catalina just to come through. So yeah, get this back up and running. So let's bring it up nicely. <laughs> While Annie is busy there, we um oh, oh no, Annie we're sticking with you. <laughs> I just thought I'll I'll start answering one of the questions, but let's uh, it seems to be on a roll there. <laughs> no, you can answer a question or two. It's fine. If you can give me one minute just to get some nice grill marks on these. Okay, so yeah, there was a question on um, how many vintages have we've made of the Catalina. the The first one we did was two thousand and seventeen. So the 18 that we re just released now is the, the second one of the Catalina and it's a, it's a semion, the grape varietal. So not something you, you see commonly out there as single varietal semions. It's used very, very often in blends, especially with Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, winemakers love blending it with Sauvignon Blanc. It works really well with Sauvignon Cosemion. It's got a lot of richness and texture of, of palate weight, but it often lacks acidity. So people aren't that keen on bottling it on its own, even though it's a great blender with Sauvignon Blanc that is high in acidity, but often lacks a bit of body. For us, it's a little bit different in with our climate that I explained you and the, the, the slopes and the cool sl site that it's on is that the vines preserve their acidity. So we've got all the beautiful flavor and richness from Semyon, but with the acidity levels as well to do a single varietal semion. So yeah, definitely not a, a common thing to do, but um, I guess we don't do ordinary. So um, yeah, there's a single varietal semion for, for you. Definitely don't. And just a quick one from me. Do you just have that one single block of sem or do you have a few other vineyards on the farm? But unfortunately, and I guess they only planted a little section of that to experiment with and also you know that the thinking was as like with everyone else it, you just need a little bit to blend with the thinking is not necessarily to make a single cultivar wine from it so unfortunately it's just this one vineyard but since we've been planting more and more close by next to that vineyard to to have a bit more of it because it's just so amazing and we've got such a demand and people asking for it that um, we can definitely do with, with some more. It was interesting earlier you just mentioned there's a lot of varieties planted on Benguela but you know the amount of accolades you've had for most of those varieties is, is quite amazing. Was there any one variety that didn't work or really doesn't work that you've actually had to remove? Yeah so we um, know they, they planted eight red grape varietals and four white. So what we've discovered over time, what works in our, not just the soils, but also the climate and the growing conditions are the um, 
as I said, Cerola is quite versatile. It works in both climates. So that is, we've got quite an interesting style. There's more savory, peppery style. But what really is putting up their hand is the Bordeaux grape varietals. You know, there's a lot of similarities between our climate and what they have in Bordeaux. We're close to a big body of water. They've got the same in, in Bordeaux. So the more it starts making more and more sense why these grape varietals are putting up their hands as, as, as the better ones. So Bordeaux grape varietals is Sauvignon Semillon on the white side. And on the red, it's your Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot. So the Bordeaux, Syrah, and um, yeah, and, the, and obviously the with in in selected slopes and soil types, Chardonnay and Pinot is the most famous wines coming out of the Walker Bay. So I didn't even mention them because that's that's just a given. But to answer your question, what did not work, sorry, was the was your typical Rhone varietals like uh, Grenache, Mouvedre, Carignan. They need a lot of heat um, and you know quite severe conditions, and and we 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 don't have enough heat, and it's just not ideal for them here, you know. So we uh, we're not focusing on those going forward. There's other regions that do them much better than what we do, so no point in trying to to get them over the line. Yeah, it's great to have those those almost 20 years of history now to really understand your property, understand the varieties that work, and to focus on those and make beautiful wine. Look at what Annie is doing on that side. Annie, what are you busy with? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we just finished our pork, but then played it up quickly with our nice grilled apples, our fresh green pepper. Like I said, you want that pepperiness and that freshness of the peppers. It just emphasizes all that green flavors in this semillon. And then as well, all the fattiness of the pork belly, that just helps cut through all of that. So it's a perfect, perfect, perfect pairing for pork. And then of course, we just got, like I said, it's for Christmas. We got a bit of a Christmas themed table set over here. So we got our grilled purple cabbage that I did a bit earlier. We got some Brussels sprouts sauce, we got a bacon. We got a nice little tender stem broccoli salad. We got some nice glazed carrots and some mashed potatoes. So yeah, ready for Christmas and Christmas dinner and Christmas Eve, whatever you want to do for it. Wow, and is there is there a seat for me? Always, Mary, always. <laughs> I only wish. Well, I don't know who's going to enjoy that feast, but uh, it looks fantastic. That paired with the wines we've tasted tonight is going to be quite an evening. Yeah, I think just on the Christmas theme, I just would like to introduce some of our some of our UK customers to some of the exciting Christmas gifts that we've got available and wines that we've got on offer. Uh, we had a new shipment of wines arriving a few weeks back. And in that shipment were a couple of surprises. Um, and I just thought I'd just share those with you. The first one that arrived was the first lot of magnums, which come in a lovely, lovely box. We've got the collage, which we'll be tasting next week. Magnum of collage. We have a magnum of the cuvee and a magnum of the syrup. So those are really exciting. We're selling those for 40 pounds a bottle. So that's equivalent to two bottles of wine. Fantastic bottle to open, a little bit of theater on Christmas day. Uh, you can imagine one of those reds with a lovely, lovely Christmas dinner. That's going to go beautifully. So well recommended. Then, of course, next week, we're going to touch on a few of the phonography range. Uh, we've got Petit Verdot, Chardonnay, and a Sauvignon Blanc that come in this beautiful box. Um, inside the box, I can just open that. Just going to get it out. They come beautifully wrapped. Each bottle, as with the Catalina, each bottle is numbered um, with a little certification of authenticity. So that's the Bonography range, selling at 35 pounds a bottle. We've got the Catalina, which Johannes showed you a lot of pictures of that. Um, that comes in a beautiful wooden box with the three wines. We're selling that for 150 a, a box of three. So what I also like to say, well, yeah, Johan says we'll let you know when to drink them. Ultimately, there's a bottle of wine there to drink. There's a bottle there to share with your friends in time. And there's a bottle to keep. Mm. Then, of course, we've got the Johan's Christmas Cracker Box, which is what tonight and next week are all about. 
That's a range of six wines. So tonight we tasted, as you know, the Joie de Vie will come in that pack. We will then move on to the Catalina. And I think that's what's quite special about this box. You can only get the Catalina in the pack of three, except for this box, which is now on offer. We've actually opened a few of those boxes and we've included this amazing wine in the box. So a bottle of Catalina, and then of course the Syrah that we tasted earlier. And then next week wines, next week's wines, we'll start off next week with a cuvee. I think a lot of you know this wine, really exciting. We'll have a little cuvee to start off with. We'll then move on to the blend, as Johan mentioned, called collage. So we've got one of those in our box. And then of course, we're gonna finish off with a beautiful bottle of our Avonography Petit Bordeaux. So Johan, I think a brilliant selection that you've made there on those wines, well done. Um, certainly a box that I'm gonna have yeah, in my Christmas collection. And a great box, you know, for the price point that you could gift to a friend or to a family member. Um, and if not, just buy it and enjoy it over the Christmas Christmas festival. Um, anything else, Johan, that I've missed? I think those are, that's our selection. We've got Black Friday coming up this Friday. Uh, we have a couple of specials running on a few of our older vintages. So those that have tasted the 2015 Collage and 2015 Cabernet, we're running a couple of good deals on those wines. We have a couple of boxes left and it was just a way of moving on to our new vintages. So those will be on special. Um, and ways to get hold of these wines, you can go to shop.leonardslee.co.uk or go to Manning's Heath website and click onto the shop. We've also now selling wine through Amazon. So go into the Amazon site, just put down Benguela Cove, um, we also have shop.benguelacove.co.uk. Um, so lots of ways to buy the wine. Or of course, as always me, pick up the phone, give me a call and I'll make sure you get your wines. Those of you that know well, by now we are doing free delivery across the UK on all wine orders greater than a case. Um, that we are doing throughout lockdown. That won't be forever more. So those that are keen to get their wines, let me know. Get hold of Emma. Of course, we've also got Emma. Those who've got Emma's details, give her a give her a drop her a line on wine at leonardslee.co.uk or at wine at manningsheath.com. Look forward to seeing you all and, and thanks so much for all of you that regularly join us and support all our events. Um, and thanks for all the amazing support and orders that we've got over the last couple of months. We really appreciate it. And it's great to see our little Benguela Cove family growing all the time. Mm -hmm. And then thanks to Johan and, and to Annie for again, an amazing session and just the insight into these amazing wines. It's, it's just great. Every time I listen to Johan and see his passion, it's just great to be part of his journey and, and Penny's journey and vision that you guys have. So from me, thanks to everyone um, and have a great evening. Thank you, Barry. Thank, Thank you very much for doing Thank See you very much, Ryan. Bye. Right. Cheers, everyone. Goodbye. Same place, same time next week. See you. Absolutely.